Chapter Three, Part Two, of An Essay on the Trial by Jury. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Beth Ann. Trial by Jury by Lysander Spooner. Chapter Three, Part Two. Section 2. The ancient common law juries were mere courts of conscience. But it is in the administration of justice, or of law, that the freedom or subjection of a people is tested. If this administration be in accordance with the arbitrary will of the legislator, that is, if his will, as it appears in his statutes, be the highest rule of decision known to the judicial tribunals, the government is a despotism and the people are slaves. If, on the other hand, the rule of decision be those principles of natural equity and justice, which constitute, or at least are embodied in, the general conscience of mankind, the people are free in just so far as that conscience is enlightened. That the authority of the king was of little weight with the judicial tribunals must necessarily be inferred from the fact already stated, that his authority over the people was but weak. If the authority of his laws had been paramount in the judicial tribunals, it would have been paramount with the people, of course, because they would have had no alternative but submission. The fact, then, that his laws were not authoritative with the people is proof that they were not authoritative with the tribunals. In other words, that they were not, as a matter of course, enforced by the tribunals. But we have additional evidence that, up to the time of Magna Carta, the laws of the king were not binding upon the judicial tribunals, and if they were not binding before that time, they certainly were not afterwards, as has already been shown from Magna Carta itself. It is manifest from all the accounts we have of the courts in which the jury sat, prior to Magna Carta, such as the court baron, the hundred court, the court leet, and the county court, that they were mere courts of conscience, and that the juries were the judges, deciding causes according to their own notions of equity, and not according to any laws of the king, unless they thought them just." These courts, it must be considered, were very numerous, and held very frequent sessions. There were probably seven, eight, or nine hundred courts a month in the kingdom, the object being, as Blackstone says, to bring justice home to every man's door. Third Blackstone 30. The number of the county courts, of course, corresponded to the number of counties. 36. The court lead was the criminal court for a district less than a county. The hundred court was the court for one of those districts anciently called a hundred, because, at the time of their first organization for judicial purposes, they comprised, as is supposed, but a hundred families. Note. Hallam says, The county of Sussex contains sixty-five hundreds. That of Dorset, forty-three while Yorkshire has only twenty-six, and Lancashire but six. Second Middle Ages, 391. End footnote. The court baron was the court for a single manor, and there was a court for every manor in the kingdom. All these courts were holden as often as once in three or five weeks, the county court once a month. The king's judges were present at none of these courts, the only officers in attendance being sheriffs, bailiffs, and stewards, merely ministerial and not judicial officers, doubtless incompetent, and, if not incompetent, untrustworthy, for giving the juries any reliable information in matters of law beyond what was already known to the jurors themselves. And yet these were the courts in which was done all the judicial business, both civil and criminal, of the nation, except appeals, 
and some of the more important and difficult cases. Note. Excepting also matters pertaining to the collection of the revenue, which were determined in the king's court of exchequer. But even in this court it was the law that none be immersed but by his peers. Mirror of Justice 49. End footnote. It is plain that the juries in these courts must, of necessity, have been the sole judges of all matters of law whatsoever, because there was no one present but sheriffs, bailiffs, and stewards to give them any instructions, and surely it will not be pretended that the jurors were bound to take their law from such sources as these. In the second place, it is manifest the principles of law by which the juries determined causes were, as a general rule, nothing else than their own ideas of natural equity, and not any laws of the king, because but few laws were enacted, and many of those were not written, but only agreed upon in council. Note. For the English laws, although not written, may, as it should seem, and that without any absurdity, be termed laws, since this itself is law, that which pleases the prince has the force of law. I mean those laws which, it is evident, were promulgated by the advice of the nobles and the authority of the prince, concerning doubts to be settled in their assembly. For if from the mere want of writing only they should not be considered laws, then unquestionably writing would seem to confer more authority upon laws themselves than either the equity of the persons constituting or the reason of those framing them glanville's preface page thirty eight glanville was chief justice of henry the second eleven eighty second turner's history of the anglo-saxons two eighty end footnote of those that were written few copies only were made printing being then unknown, and not enough to supply all or any considerable number of these numerous courts. Beside and beyond all this, few or none of the jurors could have read the laws if they had been written, because few or none of the common people could, at that time, read. Not only were the common people unable to read their own language, but at the time of Magna Carta the laws were written in Latin a language that could be read by few persons except the priests, who were also the lawyers of the nation. Mackintosh says, The first act of the House of Commons, composed and recorded in the English tongue, was in 1415, two centuries after Magna Carta. Note. Mackintosh's History of England, Chapter 3, Lardner's Cabinet Cyclopedia, 266. End footnote. Up to this time, and for some seventy years later, the laws were generally written either in Latin or French, both languages incapable of being read by the common people, as well Normans as Saxons, and one of them, the Latin, not only incapable of being read by them, but of being even understood when it was heard by them. To suppose that the people were bound to obey and juries to enforce laws many of which were unwritten, none of which they could read, and the larger part of which, those written in Latin, they could not translate or understand when they heard them read, is equivalent to supposing the nation sunk in the most degrading slavery, instead of enjoying a liberty of their own choosing. Their knowledge of the laws passed by the king was, of course, derived only from oral information, and the good laws, as some of them were called, in contradistinction to others, those which the people at large esteemed to be good laws, were doubtless enforced by the juries, and the others, as a general thing, disregarded. Note. If the laws of the king were received as authoritative by the juries, what occasion was there for his appointing special commissioners for the trial of offenses, without the intervention of a jury, as he frequently did, 
in manifest and acknowledged violation of Magna Carta and the law of the land. These appointments were undoubtedly made for no other reason than that the juries were not sufficiently subservient, but judged according to their own notions of right instead of the will of the king, whether the latter were expressed in his statutes or by his judges. End footnote that such was the nature of judicial proceedings and of the power of juries up to the time of magna carta is further shown by the following authorities the sheriffs and bailiffs caused the free tenants of their bailiwicks to meet at their counties and hundreds at which justice was so done that every one so judged his neighbor by such judgment as a man could not elsewhere receive in the like cases until such times as the customs of the realm were put in writing and certainly published. And although a freeman commonly was not to serve, as a juror or judge, without his assent, nevertheless it was assented unto that free tenants should meet together in the counties and hundreds, and lord's court, if they were not specially exempted to do such suits, and there judged their neighbors. Mirror of Justices, page 7 and 8. Gilbert, in his treatise on the Constitution of England, says, In the county courts, if the debt was above forty shillings, there issued a justitiae's, a commission to the sheriff, to enable him to hold such a plea, where the suitors, jurors, are judges of the law and fact, Gilbert's cases in law and equity, etc., etc., 456. All the ancient writs given in Glanville for summoning jurors indicate that the jurors judged of everything, on their consciences only. The writs are in this form. Summon twelve free and legal men, or sometimes twelve knights, to be in court, prepared upon their oaths to declare whether A or B have the greater right to the land, or other thing in question. C. Ritz and Beams Glanville, page 54 to 70, and 233 to 306 to 332. Crabbe, speaking of the time of Henry I, 1100 to 1135, recognizes the fact that the jurors were the judges. He says, By one law, every one was to be tried by his peers, who were of the same neighborhood as himself. By another law, the judges for so the jury were called, were to be chosen by the party and pleaded, after the manner of the Danish nembus, by which, probably, is to be understood that the defendant had the liberty of taking exceptions to or challenging the jury, as it was afterwards called. Crabbe's History of the English Law, page 55. Reeve says, the great court for civil business was the county court, held once every four weeks. Here the sheriff presided, but the suitors of the court, as they were called, that is, the freemen or landholders of the county, were the judges, and the sheriff was to execute the judgment. The hundred court was held before some bailiff, the leet before the lord of the manor's steward. Note. Of course, Mr. Reeve means to be understood that, in the hundred court, the court leet, the jurors were the judges, as he declares them to have been in the county court. Otherwise, the bailiff, or steward, must have been judge. End footnote. Out of the county court was derived an inferior court of civil jurisdiction, called the court baron. This was held from three weeks to three weeks and was in every respect like the county court, that is, the jurors were judges in it. Only the lord to whom this franchise was granted, or his steward, presided instead of the sheriff. First Reeves' History of the English Law, page 7. Chief Baron Gilbert says, Besides the tenets of the king, which held per baronium, by the right of baron, and did suit and service, served as judges at his own court, and the burghers and tenants in ancient domain, that did suit and service, served as jurors or judges, in their own court in person, and in the king's by proxy, 
there was also a set of freeholders that did suit and service, served as jurors, at the county court. These were such as anciently held of the lord of the county, and by the escheats of earldoms had fallen to the king, or such as were granted out by service to hold of the king, but with particular reservation to do suit and service, service jurors, before the king's bailiff, because it was necessary that the sheriff, or bailiff of the king, should have suitors, jurors, at the county court, that the business might be dispatched. These suitors are the paris, peers, of the county court, and indeed the judges of it, as the paris, peers, were the judges in every court baron, and therefore the king's bailiff having the court before him, there must be paris or judges, for the sheriff himself is not a judge, and though the style of the court is curia prima comitas, e c miltat vicum comitat praetent, i put b etc. First court of the county, e c knight, sheriff of the aforesaid county, held at b etc. By which it appears that the court was the sheriff's. Yet by the old feudal constitutions, the lord was not judge, but the paris, peers only, so that, even in the justities, which was a commission to the sheriff to hold plea of more than was allowed by the natural jurisdiction of the county court, the paris, peers, jurors, only were judges, and not the sheriff because it was to hold plea in the same manner as they used to do in that, the Lord's Court. Gilbert on the Court of Exchequer, Chapter 5, page 61-2 to two. It is a distinguishing feature of the feudal system to make civil jurisdiction necessary, and criminal jurisdiction ordinarily co-extensive with tenure, and accordingly there is inseparably incident to every manner a court baron curia baronium being a court in which the freeholders of the manor are the sole judges but in which the lord by himself or more commonly by a steward presides political dictionary word manor the same work speaking of the county court says the judges were the freeholders who did suit to the court see word courts in the case of freeholders attending as suitors, the county court or court baron, as in the case of ancient tenants per baronium, attending parliament, the suitors are the judges of the court, both for law and for fact, and the sheriff or the under-sheriff in the county court, and the lord or his steward in the court baron, are only presiding officers, with no judicial authority. Political Dictionary, Word, Suit. Court, Curtis, Curia, Aula. The space enclosed by the walls of a feudal residence, in which the followers of a lord used to assemble in the Middle Ages, to administer justice, and decide respecting affairs of common interest, etc. It was next used for those who stood in immediate connection with the lord and master, the paris curia peers of the court the limited portion of the general assembly to which was entrusted the pronouncing of judgment etc encyclopedia americana word court in court barons or county courts the steward was not judge but the paris peers jurors nor was the speaker in the house of lords judge but the barons only Gilbert on the Court of Exchequer, Chapter 3, page 42. Crabbe, speaking of the Saxon times, says, The sheriff resided at the hundred court, and sometimes sat in the place of the alderman, earl, in the county court. Crabbe, 23. The sheriff afterwards became the sole presiding officer of the county court. Sir Thomas Smith, Secretary of State to Queen Elizabeth, writing more than three hundred years after Magna Carta, in describing the difference between the civil law and English law, says, Eudex 
is of us called judge, but our fashion is so diverse that they which give the deadly stroke, and either condemn or acquit the man for guilty or not guilty, are not called judges, but the twelve men, and the same order as well in civil matters and pecuniary as in matters criminal. Smith's Commonwealth of England, chapter 9, page 53, edition of 1621. Court Leet that the leet is the most ancient court in the land for criminal matters, the court baron, being of no less antiquity and civil, has been pronounced by the highest legal authority. Lord Mansfeld states that this court was coeval with the establishment of the Saxons here, and its activity marked very visibly both among the Saxons and Danes. The leet is a court of record for the cognizance of criminal matters, or pleas of the crown, and necessarily belongs to the king, though a subject, usually the lord of the manor, may be, and is, entitled to the profits, consisting of the assoying pence, fines, and immersements. It is held before the steward, or was, in the ancient times, before the bailiff of the lord. Tomalin's Law Dictionary, Word Courtleet of course the jury were the judges in this court, where only a steward or bailiff of a manor presided. No cause of consequence was determined without the king's writ, for even in the county courts of the debts, which were above forty shillings, there issued a justicies commission to the sheriff to enable him to hold such plea, where the suitors are judges of the law and fact. Gilbert's History of the Common Pleas, Introduction, page 19. This position, that the matter of law was decided by the king's justices, but the matter of fact by the paris, is wholly incompatible with the common law, for the ureta, jury, were the sole judges, both of the law and the fact. Gilbert's History of the Common Pleas, page 70 note. We come now to the challenge, and of old, the suitors in court, who were judges, could not be challenged, nor by the feudal law could the pares be even challenged. Pares, qui ordinarium jurisdictionum habent, recusari non passunt. The peers who have ordinary jurisdiction cannot be rejected. But those suitors who are judges of the court could not be challenged, and the reason is that there are several qualifications required by the writ, viz., that they be liberos et legales homines de Witsoneto, free and legal men of the neighborhood, of the place laid in the declaration, etc., etc. Ditto, page 93. End of chapter 3 Part 2